I'm grateful to be here with all of you today to celebrate the extremely auspicious appearance day of Ityanand Prabhu. Let's begin with some prayers. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhescha Krupa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhatta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So I will speak about Tyanand Prabhu today and uh, I'll be sharing a PowerPoint, which also I'll be using as a whiteboard occasionally. And I'll write something on the PowerPoint if required. Now, for many people, they have not heard about Ityanand Prabhu. So if somebody is very new and uh, you know, we invite them for a program, for this program, particular program, and then the question may come, what is, what, is the, what is the occasion? It is the birthday of God's older brother. Now, if you hear this, for most people, that, that sounds incredible. What does this mean? Birthday of God's older brother. So first of all, you know, this, why, why is there incredulity when somebody hears this? Because first of all, we live in a world where many doubt even the existence of God. Even among those who accept the existence of God, they have various conceptions about maybe God is some kind of old man or a, some kind of light or whatever. The idea that God has a brother seems unbelievable. How is that possible? And on top of that, and since he is the source of everyone, so he seemed to be the set to be the, set to be defined as the source of everyone. The idea that he can have an older brother seems even more unbelievable. What is going on over here? What what kind of conception? What kind of understanding is there over here that we talk about God's older brother? So this brings us to the bhakti traditions revelation of divinity. There are many different. Uh, theistic traditions in the world among the theistic traditions there are there are different degrees of revelation of the object of devotion of god the bhakti tradition offers an unparalleled revelation of divinity it reveals god to be not just an object of contemplation or even of worship so contemplation means yes you know i i believe in god or yeah, there is some supreme intelligence underlying the world. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is something which is fascinating to contemplate on. Many people from a scientific background, if they accept divinity, usually they can accept something which is called the deistic divinity. Yes, there is some intelligence organizing the universe. And that is, it is fascinating to complete, contemplate that. That's an object of contemplation. And that is also fine. The Mahi, the Srimad Bhagavatam begins with that conception. Meditate on that ultimate reality. Even the monists, the impersonalists, those who think of the absolute truth as an all-pervading light, they also contemplate on God. Oh, meditation. The Mahi. Or for some people, uh, especially in the Abrahamic theistic traditions, God is seen as a in some ways, some kind of person, but he is it's a primarily an object of worship. So, generally, when we in our traditions, in the Bhakti tradition, we talk about going to a temple, 
No, we don't say we are going to temple to worship God. We say we are going to temple to have darshan of the Lord. So of course there will be some kind of worship happening naturally, and we will behold it. But it's more an act of beholding, because there is no clear revelation of the personal dimension of divinity. There is no form revealed in the in the world's most of the world's theistic traditions. So they go. It's a place for worship. You know, there are prayers and there is a, there is reverential meditation. So yes, God is that. But the bhakti tradition says that He is not just these things. He is not just somebody whom we should worship so that we are not punished, we are not for for our wrongdoing, so that we don't go to hell. But He is an eminently lovable person, and that He is lovable means what? That He relishes. the full range of relationships in the abrahamic traditions god is said to be situated in uh, like a majestic isolation he is far above everyone else and there is no one equal to him in catholicism they have the idea of the trinity which is vehemently criticized by especially islam that you know god is one the idea that god is trying at the three dimensions to god that is unacceptable for them but even there the idea is that okay the three things are there but god ultimately exhibits in cosmic majesty in cos in divine isolation so the idea that god has relationships and not just relationships it's not just that god is the father and we are the sons oh father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name name give us our daily bread not that god is the father and we are children or god is the master and we are servants it is there but god has a full range of relationships so if he has the full range of relationships that is where there is the there is what is the concept of krishna as rasaraj so this rasa rasa is the joy that comes from relationships raj means king so that means the one who del, who relishes the greatest joy one who is the emperor in relishing the joy that comes from relationships that is rasaraj so he is rasaraj and when we say and krishna god is complete if he is if he is really complete he is supremely complete that means that he can relish every relationship to be its fullest that you say yes god can have children god can have servants but how can god have a brother no if he, if he can't have a brother what that would mean if and if he can't have an elder brother or he can't have a sibling that would mean that god can't have something which we can have so if god can't have something which we can have then how is he complete in fact he is is incomplete so the idea of krishna as rasaraj means that he can relish every relationship to its fullest his relationship with his brother that is this paradoxical because god is even the vedic tradition says a samurdha he is the one who has no equal leave alone anybody superior to him so in that sense he is supreme and yet he has this paradoxical paradoxical means seemingly a contradictory relationship with an elder brother so now the still we may, even if we agree that okay he can have various relationship but still the question is how can he have an elder brother so this is where the idea of tattva and leela comes in so in tattva nobody is older than him but in leela he can have not just an elder elder brother but he can also have a father and a mother so god is the father of pitaham as jagato that's declared that is true but if he is to have the full range of relationships then he can have even a father and a mother so for understanding the divine there is this twofold approach to divinity that is revealed by the bhakti tradition so there is the tattva and there is the rasa so in terms of rasa through which in which leela occurs in tattva the focus is on understanding his position he is supreme he is independent he is complete it is a need anyone that is his understanding his position so so to tattva we need to understand his position krishna talks about uh, this in the bhagavad gita that tattvataha in 4.9 understand me in truth 
But then beyond the tattva understanding, there is the rasa understanding. That means if he understands his rasa, he relishes relationships, then we understand his disposition. Not just his position, but his disposition. And what is his disposition? His disposition refers to his lovability, his accessibility, and his vulnerability. Lovability means, see, when is somebody lovable? If some, if I say, I, I mean, I love someone very well. But suppose you know, somebody has, say, nowadays social media, some celebrity has a million followers, and uh, you know, maybe a fan of that. Uh, there may be million people who may be fans of that celebrity, but how many can say they have a relationship with that celebrity? You know, that celebrity may not be, may be completely inaccessible to them. So therefore, what, where is the relationship? So there is the relationship is to be there. Then there is that the, the lovability comes through accessibility. Only when the person is accessible, you can have admiration for a person. You can have, be a fan of a person, but if you want to be in a relationship, that Lord has to be accessible. So he makes himself accessible. So although God is supreme above everyone else, he does not keep himself in, cause, in, in isolated majesty. He's accessible. And not only is accessible, he makes himself vulnerable. Vulnerable means he acts as if he needs others. When Mother Yashoda uh, she feels needed by Krishna. She thinks that if I don't feed Krishna, Krishna will become weak. He will become sick. He will. He may even die. Now this is absurd. Krishna is all powerful. He's the strength of everyone. But Krishna appears like a small child and makes his devotees makes himself vulnerable to his devotees, and that's how their sweetness, their sweetness comes in the relationship. So. This so if you don't appreciate Ityanand Prabhu's appearance, we need to understand that the tattva is there, but the rasa approach. How can God have an older brother? Because he has, he has a wide gamut of relationships, and in this rasa approach, there are various hidden aspects of divinity. So the idea of a God as a bluish black cowherd boy, that itself is extremely rare how many people know about it at least in modern times in today's world very not many people know about krishna as god in fact uh, there is one christian pastor who wrote a book about uh, you know the strangest ideas in today's world and he asked one of his parishioners what is the strangest idea you have heard and he said that the hari krishna is approaching me on the street and giving me a book and selling that God is a bluish black cowherd boy. That is the strangest thing I've heard ever. So that itself is difficult for people to understand. Mm -hmm. So that is that no knowability is rare. How can God be a, a, to be a, a boy? Uh, but then not only God as a boy, God is a golden dancer who seeks to know his own lovability. Now God is expected to have some gravitas. And of course he has his gravitas. But it's not just gravitas that defines divinity. It's also ecstasy. So Krishna comes and dances. There was an atheistic thinker who said that he, the, he was so turned off by the Christian conception of divinity that he said, I don't believe in this. I will believe in a God who knows how to dance. So Mahaprabhu, he, he unfortunately he never knew about Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is defined as dancing God. He, he did many, many things. But his greatest characteristic was his, his ecstatic Sankirtan and how he inspired others to Sankirtan. And why was he doing this? As a, why did he come as a golden dancer? He wanted to know what is so lovable about me. That is even more rare. And most rare among the aspects of divinity which are, which are hidden is, is God who savors and shares his intimate lovability as profound mercy. That is Nityananda Prabhu. So Nityananda Prabhu is who he is actually God himself. So the in the Bhakti tradition, it is understood that there is one God, but one God is not limited to one form. Advaitam Achutam Anadim Anantarupam. He is Advaita, he is only one, but he has Anantarupa. So the same one divinity who manifests as Krishna, he also manifests as his brother Balaram. 
and krishna appears in kalyuga as shri chaitanya mahaprabhu and balaram appears in kalyuga as nityananda prabhu so by shri prabhupads and by the gaudiya traditions outreach mahaprabhu is known quite widely and nityananda prabhu is also known so this is hidden hidden because it is not easy to understand it is a confidential aspect of divinity so why is it confidential because it's not something which can be for people who don't even understand or accept the idea of god the idea, this idea of god having a brother it's extremely difficult to understand so when you talk about confidentiality see confidential it's it's not so much secret as private secret means that which is just which is consciously hidden from others private means that which is not the concern of others so for example no say if in a public place like a temple or somewhere uh, a couple of family members the husband a wife or a, pa- a parent and a child they want to talk with each other and if either of them is with someone else then they may say to the other person can we have a little privacy can we have a few minutes of privacy now what that means is that you know can we talk with each other so this guhia is conf- now it is not that what they are talking is top secret which cannot be told to everyone no it doesn't concern others it's not relevant to others so there is krishna talks about the principle of ye thamam prapadyante tam sathaiva bhajamya ham that there is a revelation he reveals himself in proportion to what people are interested in so as as people seek understanding accordingly understanding comes so that is revelation of divinity so so the revelation of the lord as nityanand prabhu is extremely rare and it's it's rare not in the sense that it has been kept consciously a secret but rather it is private only those who become sufficiently interested in divinity those who are open to more intimate understandings of divinity for them this is a this is like a bonanza this is all oh, there is so much to know about god and becomes like a veritable devotional feast so now with this background i took a little time to uh, set this background it is important for us to understand that dityananda prabhu when he appears his name itself signifies the mission nitya is eternal and ananda is happiness so what does it mean nityananda the one who savors and shares eternal happiness so let's try to understand this from a diagrammatic perspective see there is the spiritual domain of the nityananda mission so this is not referred to a particular organization with a particular name but there is a mission of lord nityananda so there is the spiritual domain which is nitya ananda which is eternal and full of bliss that is the whole spiritual world parastasmat bhavonyo vyakto tat sanatanah yah sa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyat suna binashyati krishna says when all in this world is destroyed that part is not destroyed so it is from that domain that the lord descends so that is his ecstatic descent he descends with his ecstasy he comes filled with joy he is joyful and he comes to uh, comes with his joy so it is on this day today uh, around 500 years ago that lord ityanand prabhu appeared in india in bengal in a place called ekachakra so there is a ecstatic descent from the divine domain and what is the purpose of that ecstatic domain it empowers it empowers us for a compassionate ascent so ascent is that we rise from here our consciousness rises from the material domain the material domain is characterized by its anitya and it is nirananda anitya that nothing here is permanent and even while it exists quite often it is it is devoid of pleasure it is because life is so bankrupt of pleasure that we try to create so many sources of pleasure mm-hmm. that we try to say have entertainment 
now entertainment is in one sense it's it's not that we are enjoying it it is we are watching somebody else enjoy and we're getting second hand enjoyment through that it's second hand enjoyment so maybe a hero and a heroine in the movie are hugging and some people, the audience whistle and think oh, if only i would be there i would enjoy so much so it's second hand enjoyment but why because the enjoyment in the world is so little that people seek it desperately and that's what is being referred to over here so the world is nirananda and it is in this nirananda world see see we now so we say is there a, the lord's mission he says is to he comes from the spiritual domain to take us to the spiritual domain somebody may say hey, does the spiritual domain really exist i don't believe in it okay we we all can choose what we want to believe but the fact is that we don't we may not believe in the spiritual domain but then we try to create a domain of ecstasy a domain of joy the whole purpose is we want a better world we want a better world than what exists and we try to create it through entertainment we try to create to sci-fi we try to create to create it through movies in india currently the uh, the cricket, indian premier league cricket is going on uh, or at least its auction is going on and the crores and crores of rupees are spent on it millions and millions of dollars in fact uh, the amount of money that is spent on one ipl now that can feed all the hungry people of india throughout the year so people are so desperate for entertainment people are so desperate for a higher life so what happens is yes we may get some moments of thrill we may get some thrill so, so the the normal material domain is anitya and nirananda now what happens is when we try to get uh, we try to create pleasure through some entertainment we that entertainment is also anitya it is temporary but there is some little ananda in between it is anitya and little ananda we are so desperately pleasure craving that we try to seek some pleasure but lord nityananda descends to take us to the place of nitya ananda the place of eternal bliss and how does he do that by purifying and raising our consciousness by so it is his compassion that he gives us the opportunity to ascend to rise upwards so the lord comes because he doesn't want us to be unhappy somebody say i am not unhappy i am happy okay fine uh, yes now that depends on how we define you know, happiness is not just like a state it's more like a continuum in general if you want to say i am i happy and happy okay what is the definition of unhappiness a simple definition could be that two things to not get what we want and to get what we don't want that yasmat priya priya vi yoga sanyoga janma that the priya that which is dear for us it goes away from us and that which is not that is unwanted by us that comes to us so we all have right now you can think of situations in your life where something we want we don't have it and something we don't want that's come in our, in our life it may be in relations it may be in finances it may be in health it may be in professional social circles so this world is a place of distress and lord and we can try to tackle these distress at a practical level and we should but we also need to raise our consciousness it is for that purpose that ityan and the prabhu comes that we belong to a place where there can be constant happiness forever so nityananda prabhu he is supremely merciful now even in the legal system there is a tension between mercy and justice so justice is me justice is following the rules you know you have done this wrong therefore you will be punished this is the wrong and this is a proportional punishment for the wrong that is playing by the rules hmm? he doesn't he didn't also not nityananda prabhu uh, doesn't play by the rules but he fulfills the purpose of the rules he is called avadhut is avadhut shiromani he is called not just avadhut means one who doesn't follow the rules one who transcends the rules but and he is the greatest among those who transcend the rules now we may say really if somebody says proudly i am a rule breaker really is there something to be proud of hmm? most people when they break rules they are afraid they want to hide they want to conceal once a person was caught by a 
was pulled over by a traffic cop and it was speeding way above the speed limit so the traffic cop said didn't you see the speed speed limit sign so the the driver said person said i saw the speed limit sign i just didn't see you <laughs> i just didn't see you what that means is that i will follow the rules as long as i don't get caught so most people play by the rules and if somebody is a rule breaker they want to hide it but nityanand prabhu is said to be the rule breaker and he's glorified as that but he's not exactly a breaker of rules he's a transcendent of rules transcendent of rules so there is there are rules and there is something below the rules and there is something above the rules so he gives mercy to anyone and everyone in even if they have no spiritual interest even if they have no spiritual qualification even if they have no spiritual background so when something is given to the worthy that is justice hmm? so when something is given to somebody unworthy that is mercy so he doesn't play by the rules that means playing by the rules means giving that which is giving that to giving something valuable to those people who deserve it who qualify for it so nityanand prabhu when he appears in the world he is actually he he is avdoot how does he not play by the rules his appearance is quite extraordinary so some people are attracted to spirituality by those who conform to their expectations of spirituality that means okay of how should a spiritualist be maybe a spiritual should, should be simple should be sober should be uh, should be gentle or everybody has a particular idea of what has their idea of what spiritual somebody spirit or a spiritualist should be and when somebody conforms to their expectations oh yes this is what this is what i i i'll i respect this person i want to know more learn from this person but there are others who are who are attracted by those who challenge and even confound their expectations of spirituality oh i didn't expect a spiritualist to be like this you know i thought the spiritual people were grave and you know this person is so cheerful so jolly oh okay i thought i didn't know spiritual people are like this so so nityanand prabhu attracts these kind of people so nityanand prabhu what he does is his appearance is such that he challenges oh this person couldn't be spiritual if this person is spiritual that means spirituality must be cool so he attracts people that way to so challenge and confound their expectations of spirituality so let's see how nityanand prabhu does that so there is this concept of niyam agraha niyam agraha there are two aspects to it there is niyam and agraha so niyam is the rule and agraha is not following graha is to accept and agraha is to reject so niyam agraha is to reject the rules and act whimsically now that is bad that is that is unhealthy mm-hmm. that will lead us nowhere so like if somebody is going on a traffic going going uh, traffic to traffic and don't follow traffic rules that's that that will be dangerous for them dangerous for others so there is niyam agraha and then there is nearing niyam agraha Hmm. so hmm, what happens over here is that niyam agraha means insisting on the letter uh, of the rule at the cost of its spirit that uh, that means this is what is to be done this is always to be done say for example somebody does uh, somebody says, even if a ambulance is going through and there's a life life or death situation Says, no you have to stop for red signal no no that's not required there are times when the the spirit has to be highlighted more and more so what nitanand prabhu does is he it is not that he rejects the rules the letter of the rules he doesn't he doesn't reject the rules of spirituality rules of, that govern spiritualists for the sake of rejecting them but for a higher purpose in whatever way is he pursues the spirit in whatever way is most effective so that is his extraordinary mercy that he let's try to understand this that see there are people who may who are already who are already somewhat spiritually inclined who are having a pious upbringing they may go to a temple they may go to a holy place and they may meet with the holy people they they are in, inspired and transformed by the sacred atmosphere over there and those kind of people will be delivered 
but what about those who will never go to such places how will they be delivered so nityanand prabhu is especially concerned about such people so what happened is one way his comp- his compassionate comportment came in is that he would dress in extraordinarily opulent clothes so i'll focus on this particular uh, pastime of tyan prabhu where tyan prabhu he, although he was uh, he was a spiritualist initially he was a brahmachari as a avdut and then he sometimes he is referred to as sanyasi but technically he was a brahmachari he never took the official vows of sanyas and uh, out of respect sometimes he is referred to as sanyasi in some circles but he was a brahmachari and then later on on nichanand mahaprabhu's instruction he became a grahastha but even as a brahmachari sometimes he would dress in extraordinarily opulent clothes and he would expensive or- ornaments and this is what happened once when he was in navadweep and he was at the place of a person called uh, hiranya pandit so when he was at the house of hiranya pandit there while living there there was a thief a very well known you could say infamous thief in that place and this infamous thief he uh, he was searching all constantly searching like all other thieves for opportunities to uh, to make quick money to rob people and at one particular time when he encountered nityanand prabhu he saw nityanand prabhu wearing such a opulent he was having such wealth around him he thought that you know this is one person if i can just get this like it is one robbery which will give me all the wealth that i want now he was such a person who would never have gone to anything like a temple and yet dityanand prabhu decided that he was going to deliver that person and how did dityanand prabhu do that he did that by actually his avadhut vesh his vesh was this person would not have turned to a sacred person or sacred people there are so many sacred people i don't care about them and it's holy people i don't care about them but dityanand prabhu by his extraordinary dress he said oh i want to go and rob this person and he told he had his own gang so he said that this gang is there and with this gang if i go and if i rob this person you know this is one robbery which will settle us for the whole life this is one job you don't have to do any more jobs after this so he said okay so his colleagues were also intrigued and they decided to go then he was staying in now hiranya pandit he was hiranya pandit not a very wealthy person but dyanand prabhu although he had so much wealth he didn't, he didn't really care for that wealth he he cared for the wealth of devotion and so normally somebody is very wealthy they will want to go in a house go and stay at somebody's place who is also very very wealthy hmm? sometimes when devotees conduct programs and if there are some elite people if they want to come for a home they home program they will not come to the home of a person who is like whose house is very small they want to go to similar places but mahap nityanand prabhu he was not like that hiranya pandit was a was a not a very wealthy person but nityanand prabhu was staying at his place so they decided to go and rob and they went there and they were waiting the devotees were relishing the supreme wealth of devotion they were chanting the holy names and as they were chanting the holy names more and more and more these uh, thieves they were waiting and waiting and waiting and while inside the devotees were becoming more and more ecstatic through the chanting in the bhagavad gita krishna says that यानिशा सर्वभूतानां तस्याम जागृति संयमी यस्याम जागृति भूतानि सानिशा पश्यतो मुने दैट दैट व्हिच इज डे फॉर ऑल लिविंग बीइंग्स इज नाइट फॉर द सेल्फ रियलाइज एंड दैट व्हिच इज डे फॉर द सेल्फ रियलाइज इज नाइट फॉर द ऑल लिविंग बीइंग्स सो व्हाट इट मींस इज दैट इट्स नॉट दैट दैट सेल्फ रियलाइज पीपल एंड अदर पीपल आर लिविंग इन टू डिफरेंट टाइम जोन्स ऑपोजिट टाइम जोन्स this that is not what it refers to what it means is that day is the domain of activity of energy and night is the domain of inactivity lethargy darkness so although it was night the devotees were ecstatic they were being filled with more and more energy but because these thieves outside they had no they didn't have any devotional interest so they started getting 
bored, tired, and they fell asleep, waiting for this kirtan to end. Uh, so they, they said that okay, when, when they, they were thinking that when he goes, when everybody goes to sleep over there, then we will enter and we'll rob, because they, although they had their weapons, just by the sound of the kirtan, they thought there must be a lot of people over here. There are so many people; it will not be easy for us to rob. So let's wait for them to go to sleep. But the 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 devotees didn't go to sleep; they themselves went to sleep, and then. then they slept throughout the night and then in the morning when the crows started calling and uh, the birds started chirping they woke up the the uh, the the cocks the hen and the cock started crowing so then and they said what happened and the, their leader woke up and he looked at it, hey why did you why did you sleep for so long why didn't you wake me up you slept first you slept first they all started blaming each other you know we lost our opportunity and finally now it's interesting that the the culture of virtue or culture of religiosity was there uh, that their leader he thought okay why did we fail he said okay this is you fell asleep i fell asleep whoever it is somebody said but he said actually there is a deeper cause and the deeper cause is we are worshipers of the goddess we are worshipers of durga at that time in bengal uh, the worship of the goddess durga was quite common and he said that uh, because we didn't worship durga devi before we went robbing that's why our attempt was foiled so we displeased durga devi so it's amazing that it's this religion alone religiosity alone doesn't automatically bring virtue somebody may go to a temple somebody may worship but that doesn't necessarily mean that person will be doing good things they here the people are thinking that okay our job is to rob so we now generally when we start we want to do something important we may go to the temple and take blessings of god so here for them it is project robbery and for doing starting the project robbery they wanted to go and take the blessings of the goddess so that's why there is a the bhagavad gita significantly differentiates between between religiosity and spirituality religiosity means doing some rituals but is that transforming somebody's heart Gita says in his conclusion, "Sarva dharma an paritijya maam ekam sharanam rachan." Says, "Give up mere religiosity, uh, give up mere rituals, and focus on becoming spiritual." So, but still, it is to be appreciated that they were, although they were robbers, they still were worshiping the goddess. They said, "Let's wait for a, some days," and they they knew from the, the from their discreet inquiry that Nityanandra was going to be there for some time, so they went back, and then. and again they came this time they worshiped god the goddess properly and when they came back as they were coming coming initially the, the night was uh, the sky was clear they could see the stars and the uh, moon in the sky and suddenly the sky became clouded it became pitch dark it started it started appearing like it was going to be stormy rains and thunderbolt and uh, and lightning and showers and then as they are walking uh, they were just going toward the house inside the house there was ecstatic kirtan going on and suddenly they all fell into a ditch now they had marked out a path how were they going to go inside and they didn't know from where this ditch came and as they fell into that ditch uh, and they found that inside there were all kinds of insects they thought this side is becoming alarmed first they were alarmed if we call out to others we will be caught as thieves because they had their weapons and stuff with them and if we don't call out you know what kind of what is it that is biting us are these mere insects the mosquitoes are this are this snakes and scorpions they were petrified they were horrified and, and as if that was not bad enough they were trying to uh, trying to catch on somewhere in the ditch and come out of it and then suddenly You know, see what happens is when it's dark we can't see, but even in dark we can see something. It requires some amount of seeing to know that we are not seeing. For a person who is blind, they for them they can never see. It is when we are seeing, and then we can't see. So now, if suddenly we wake up and there's complete darkness around us, we won't not be able to see, but they were still able to see some some light from the house nearby and suddenly that light went off and they said what happened and then they realized that actually they had become blinded 
and they look at each other the person tried to look at his hand they couldn't see anything they were horrified what happened how did we become blind like this this was what was supposed to be like their dream job it was turning out to be their worst nightmare and what was happening was through all this their heart was being churned with that they all had done many many wrongs but what nitanand prabhu was doing nitanand prabhu the supreme lord was giving his mercy so generally when mercy is given there is it's not that a person has done huge amount of wrongs and they just let completely scot free okay there is some symbolic uh, some at least some symbolic punishment is to be there so this whole nightmarish experience was actually their karma coming upon them in a very concentrated form they were horrified and at that time what happened was because they had worshiped the goddess in the bhakti tradition there is a description of a hierarchy of divinity also there are devatas and above the devatas there is the supreme lord so because they had worshiped the goddess and they had that level of, at least their head had that level of piety so earlier he had thought of the goddess and now what happened was by nityanand prabhu's mercy when they were going through those situations externally that nityanand prabhu is also also present in their hearts you know god is present inside each one of us in the form of the parmatma and from that indwelling divinity he got an insight who oh, actually how can so many things be going wrong for us it must be because of some special reason and then a conviction arose within his heart he said actually this person nityananda he is not an ordinary person he is not even an extraordinary person he is the supreme person he is god himself and as soon as this conviction arose within his heart it was not just like a insight coming or idea coming it just emerged as a conviction and with that conviction he started praying fervently uh, so uh, it started fervently 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 they started calling out to nityanand prabhu he started praying and the others also started praying he says please forgive me we try to rob you we try to offend you please have mercy on us and when the lord saw that the little door of mercy was open little door of receptivity was open in their hearts then he gave a shower of mercy so as if miraculously their eyes came back all the insects that were tormenting them disappeared the storm cleared there's again a clear night and they came out and they had some good sense so they immediately went and cleaned themselves a little bit and they and then they dressed themselves properly and then they came back to with this head thief at the at that in the front they all came nityanand prabhu was doing ecstatic kirtans and as they were doing kirtans they came in and initially all the thief, all the common people there were apprehensive oh these are they are known to be robbers if they have come here it like if say we are having some celebration we have a temple and some suddenly some mafia don comes with a whole gang over there everybody will become frightened what did they come here for but this this heftily bodied thief along with other hefty thieves came and they came straight walking and then they f- came right up to nityanand prabhu and everybody's tension was increasing what is going to happen what is going to happen and then as they came near nityanand prabhu that person just fell down like a dandavat and offered obeisances he says i surrender to you please have mercy on me and and nityanand prabhu Uh, raised lifted him up caught up from his seat lifted him up and blessed him embraced him and told him that everything that you have done will be forgiven bro just accept lord chaitanya's mercy and stop doing wrong things and he agreed he committed his life to nitanand prabhu and his heart was completely cleansed not only was he freed from future sinful reaction that were going to come but the sinful desires the greedy greed that was there within his heart that was also removed and with that he just became transformed and he joined in the kirtan he didn't even think about all the extraordinary or- ornaments and precious stones that were there with dhanand prabhu because he had got param drishtvani vartate he had got a higher taste he was tasting the sweetness of divine mercy he was t- tasting the sweetness of the holy names and of the kirtan of the holy names he forgot everything else and then he felt so ecstatic 
that the whole kirtan went on for night he participated throughout it and for all the days that tyan prabhu was there he would continue the he would join the kirtans nanityan prabhu was, would travel so what he did was he didn't travel with nityanand prabhu but along with nityanand prabhu wherever nityanand prabhu would go he would go separately and wherever nityanand prabhu would go he would go there and there are diff- there are like a book distribution traveling party there is a there are like there are different devotees who travel and dis- uh, share krishna bhakti so he had like a uh, robbers outreach program so wherever nityanand prabhu would go he would go to that place and he would go to the hide out of all the robbers over there and he would tell them about nityanand now he was a, he was a widely known and feared uh, head of robbers and then they saw he is transformed he is speaking this uh, he had credibility in robber circles and so this same phenomena that nityanand would be doing kirtans and suddenly the local mafia would come there and everybody was apprehensive and those local leaders would come with this particular thief uh, who had now become a devotee and they would come and they would all surrender their lives to nityanand prabhu and they would all become devotees so such is the extraordinary mercy of nityanand prabhu by which he transformed the hearts of those whose hearts could not normally be transformed and this is how nityanand that eternal joy he spread far and wide and that same nityanand prabhu oh, and his mercy are available to us today shla prabhu pad uh, taught that uh, taught in the tradition of nityanand prabhu and chaitanya mahaprabhu and he especially emphasized the mercy of nityanand prabhu shla prabhu pad was a part of the gaudiya tradition traditionally in the gaudiya temples previously there would be gaura gadadhar chaitanya mahaprabhu and gadadhar gadadhar pandit but shla prabhu pad introduced gaura nitai says because nitai nityanand prabhu and his mercy are vital for us for our spiritual growth and therefore he said that if we pray, prabhu pad would say that if we pray to nityanand prabhu for his mercy by his mercy even the impossible can become possible whether there are impossible obstacles in our life externally or there are impossible uh, to deal with impurities inside us internally either way we can become purified and transformed and empowered by nityanand prabhu's mercy and we can progress through this difficult life through this difficult world which is anitya nirananda toward the destination of nityanand so nityanand prabhu comes to take us towards the abode of nityanand and shri prabhu pad has come to has, has established the international society of krishna consciousness to share to continue sharing that tradition that legacy of extraordinary mercy so we all are indebted to we all can be indebted to shri prabhu pad for bring for introducing us to nityanand prabhu and for giving us an opportunity to hear his glories and to relish his mercy so i'll conclude with a prayer but before that i'll quickly summarize what i discussed i discussed three main points today first was the extraordinariness of the festival that we are celebrating the birthday of god's older brother so in the bhakti tradition god is revealed to be not just as some remote divinity as an object of worship or meditation contemplation but as a very lovable divinity who relishes the full range of relationships is rasaraj and so through tattva we understand uh, we understand god's supremacy but through uh, through rasa we understand we understand not just his position but his disposition his lovability accessibility vulnerability and then we discuss specifically about nityanand prabhu what is his mission that he comes to give nityanand he comes from the eternal abode there is a compassion there is his ecstatic descent to uh, help us to ascend towards him that is his compassion and to that end so one specific attribute of nityan so that was the philosophical understanding of nityananda prabhu nityananda prabhu and his mission and so god can have a older brother because he is supreme and he relishes all relationships now specifically when nityananda prabhu discussed he he is so merciful that his mercy goes beyond the letter of the law he is he, there is there is a letter and there is the spirit of the law so we talk about two kinds of niyamagraha and nityananda prabhu goes beyond that so not justice but mercy and extraordinary mercy gives to everyone 
and we discussed one particular manifestation of his mercy was how he delivered thieves those who had no spiritual inclination those who would not go to a spiritual person those who would worship only so that they could rob better such a per such people they were attracted through nityananda prabhu's extraordinary of opulence he didn't care for that opulence but he used that opulence to attract others and then nityananda prabhu's miraculous mercy they were all transformed and elevated so we all can pray that whatever conditionings we have by nitan prabhu's mercy we can we too can be transformed and elevated so i'll conclude with a prayer to nitan and the prabhu over here nityanandam aham naumi aham naumi i offer obeisances to nityananda sarvananda karam param sarva ananda all happiness karam he provides he manifests he he creates param supreme all an all happiness and supreme happiness among those who provide happiness he is the supreme and how does he do that how does he give us access to that happiness hari nama pradam devam he is that divinity who gives the holy name who gives taste for the holy name who gives ecstasy in the holy name and how does he do it avadhuta shiromanim he doesn't just stick to the rules he goes beyond the rules doing whatever it takes for uh, enabling and empowering people to elevate their consciousness and attain nityananda so for such a such a merciful lord nityananda let us offer his obeisances to him and let us pray that we too get a drop of his mercy shri nityananda prabhu ki jai thank you very much hare krishna so i can see there are a few questions how much time do we have for questions hare krishna prabhu thank you hare for krishna. the class prabhu we have uh, 30 more minutes if that's fine with you okay sure so <clears throat> let's look at the various questions so what is the difference between religiosity and spirituality um when we chant or do aarti aren't those technical rituals since there's a time and procedure for them how do we become less religious and more spiritual and through this we become more virtuous well okay so there is a difference between religion and religiosity religiosity is more of religious pomposity so it's a it's a portmanteau like we have smog it is smoke plus fog is called smog so religiosity is religion plus pomposity that means when somebody does religion for ostentation just for show just uh, uh, for external purposes that is religiosity just maybe they are in a social circle where some, if somebody appears to be religious they are respected a lot or they use god for their own ulterior motives like that so religiosity is simply ritualism without understanding the purpose so the rituals themselves the practices the word rituals often has a negative connotation that's why in our tradition often we use the word of practices so spiritual practices like chanting worshiping the deities doing aarti see they, these rituals themselves are not bad they 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 are required in every walk of life for that matter if you see when you meet a person when we meet a person we shake hands now why shake hands that's a ritual that's a ritual of greeting and different countries different cultures there are different rituals some people may just nod their heads some people may bow down and some people in the british tradition there were people who do curtsies so there are different so now in today's world the ritual of handshake has become very common so that's a ritual now rituals they are essential they give structure they bring structure and order to our interactions with each other if you meet someone and if there is no ritual okay what do i do how do i express cordial cordiality we'll shake hands that's a ritual in the vedic tradition we may fold our hands that is also a that's also a way of greeting now of course i'll come to that particular ritual a little later so rituals are they give structure for our actions so rituals themselves are not bad sometimes there are even in modern society where people condemn superstition and blind faith now there are so many people who have so many people follow blind rituals so for example the whole idea of blowing a candle 
on birthday that's a complete superstition why were candles blown it actually that 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 or that that tradition or that practice originates from a a norwegian myth that they said that when small children are growing at that time on their birthdays some evil spirits enter into their body and that the the number of years that child is that many evil spirits will enter into the body and their idea is that if you extinguish candles the evil spirits will go away so that's why you extinguish candles now most people don't believe in evil spirits uh, but still what is it has become a ritual now so rituals are there in every walk of life hmm? when uh, when in a cricket for example somebody hits a boundary now why does the umpire do like this now what has this got this has nothing to do with four or this has got nothing to do with six it's a ritual so rituals are everywhere in life so but the point is that is there a purpose for the rituals so in the bhakti tradition in the in spiritual traditions in general and bhakti tradition in particular the rituals are designed in such a way that they enable us to develop the or to express or to cultivate the appropriate emotions so for example when we go in front of the lord we offer obeisances so that brings humility then we fold our hands and approach in the mood of reverence that that fosters devotion so it is not that we have to become more less religious it is not that we have to become less religious and more spiritual rather we need to become religiously spiritual because re the religious practices are the way to spirituality many people when they say i want to be i want to be spiritual but not religious they say like that because their understanding is that they think religion means being having blind faith being dogmatic being being just doing following some superstitions and that's why they don't want to do that but what is required is for each one of us to recognize that we all are growing and the practices that are there they help us to raise our consciousness so if somebody does the practices without actually striving to raise their consciousness then that is a problem so yes it is we want to be not, not relig uh, we want to be religiously spiritual mm -hmm. and that's what the bhakti tradition is all about thank you so so i can read out a few questions that we have in the chat yeah. um so one of the questions we have is at the age of 12 one mendicant requested hadai pandit to give his son nitai to accompany him uh, in travel for preaching was this mendicant lakshmi pati tirtha and uh, i think this is from pitambar prabhu he is saying there were there are two versions some say that it was lakshmi pati tirth some say uh, he was someone else okay mm. see anityananda prabhu when he was a child he was told at 12 that as a, a sanyasi came and he said i want a charity give me your son i want to take him with him now the early life of nityanand prabhu is uh, is documented but not exhaustively documented there is a book called nityanand charitamrit we describe his past time but nityanand charitamrit is attributed to rindavan das thakur as far as our traditions historical records go it is not written by rindavan das thakur in 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 the contemporary attributions of nityanand uh, of what the immediate follows of nityanand of rindavan das thakur when they described nandan das thakur in the books that he wrote nityanand charitamrit doesn't come in that so therefore there are some aspects about him was that about nityanand prabhu especially his early life things which are not described in chaitanya bhagavat and chaitanya charitamrit uh, there is not that much clarity so that is why um, it is not very clear so now it is it is understood that nityanand prabhu was at one level he so exactly what he did during those years before he came to be with mahaprabhu see we have mahaprabhu's biographies and when because we have mahaprabhu's biographies so Maha, when chaitanya mahaprabhu when nityan prabhu came to meet mahaprabhu and was with him from that time there is relatively clear status so there is relatively clear knowledge about him so the previous things there is a lack of clarity and there are different gaudiya vaishnavas who say different things so my understanding would be that um, there is uh, unless there is a very definitive 
uh, source it is is going to be difficult to resolve this controversy mm. thank you so, there's another question from yeah, I can see. Is, is, so yeah, even about his spiritual yeah. master also i would say that uh, tanpu considered um, so now the idea that once god brother can be considered as good as spiritual master well that depends again on what is the see when we talk about god brother uh, there is a huge difference among god brothers also say for example for us all prabhupada disciples are very senior devotees but if you talk about prabhupada disciples you know somebody who came to Shri, uh, the krishna consciousness movement in 65 and somebody who came in 77 just before prabhupada departed they took initiation at that time they say oh that devotee that is very 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 senior to me so we don't know and it was when exactly both of them took initiation so Nithyan prabhu uh, recognized madhavendra puri's exalted status and that's why he so it's now spiritual master can also mean shiksha guru so for many of us, you know, we may be introduced, we may be introduced to Krishna consciousness by uh, some devotees who may later become our god brothers. That means we may take initiation from that same person, uh, from the spiritual master, uh, who is also initiated the person who brought us to Krishna Bhakti. So in one sense we become god brothers, but still we may be, they may be, we may treat them like our spiritual master, like our, at least our gurus, not Diksha guru, but Shisha gurus. So Madhavendra Puri's relationship with. Uh, so Nityan Prabhu saw Madhavendra Puri venerable because of his exalted spiritual status, even if he was, uh, even if they were God brothers. Then uh, Nityan Prabhu entered Grahastha Ashram. Yes, Mahaprabhu told him to do that because Mahaprabhu wanted that Nityan Prabhu would be uh, would reach out to a broader number of people. As Sanyasi, there is a, there are limits to what can be done. As Grahasthas, he could go and meet everyone. Nityan Prabhu says that even if Nityan Prabhu will go to a bar. I know he's going there not to drink, but to get people over there to become drunk with love for Krishna. So now for sannyasi to do that would be inappropriate. So now Avdhut is not exactly sannyasi, as I said. Avdhut is more of a person who oh, he, was, he was a person who had, you could say, renounced the rules or he rose above the rules and he went above that. So mm. Now, see, regarding the past lives of certain characters, I wouldn't go too much into those things because if we go into past lives, we can learn about past lives. But the more important thing is that Tyan Prabhu is merciful. If he's merciful, then his mercy can come independently. Even if his parents have not done anything in the previous lives, still they can, he can bestow his mercy. So, if you find some specific things in specific sources, that will be wonderful. But even if that is not there, the principle of mercy still remains. And in fact, the principle of mercy becomes more extraordinary if they, they, were not, they had not done anything special in previous lives. I'm not saying that they're not, but further research will be required. Mm -hmm. So, what does Nityan Prabhu look for? He's very merciful. Uh, what, does he, what do we need? Uh, for his mercy well uh, broadly speaking we can say tatra laulyam api maulyam ekalam it is eager desire if you just if you have a little desire he will his mercy will increase that desire if you have a lot of desire his mercy will increase that desire further so now when we have desire everything else will follow there is humility is required but in one sense if i have a desire if say if somebody is in India and they have a desire to go to America, then just their desire brings some level of humility. They will stand in a long queue at the immigrant uh, at the visa office and they will plead their case. They will send so many applications. They will do all that is required and all this requires humility. So if we just have a little desire and if we don't have that desire, then you know, maybe we are fortunate enough to associate with somebody who has that desire. And through that, we get the desire. So Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha. So in association, desire will come. So it's a question which is uh, of a different nature, but I'll quickly address this. <clears throat> if you follow Prabhupada, as you say today, why in the past have you said that his statements are not as per Shastra? Now, there are some uh, 
some random question random reports on the internet about something that had happened uh, more than 5 6 years ago basically shri prabhupad himself was a living person it is not that prabhupad you know he learned from shastra and his eyes and ears were close to everything else and it was that you no know, prabhupad went to went to a college scottish church college prabhupad learned from there certain things so prabhupad uh, the college that prabhupad learned was was learned from the was a christian college prabhupad learned some christian conceptions from there so so for example prabhupad said that uh, Pr- prabhupad had a college professor who taught that the female brain is smaller than the male brain and prabhupad spoke that so that statement of prabhupad was not according to shastra and prabhupad himself has acknowledged that at times you know well, in one lecture prabhupad said that you know he was talking to some people most of them were from christian background he says in your aquarian gospel it is said that jesus christ came to, went to india and he went to jagannath puri and then uh, the devotees afterwards ravindra swarup and others were more scholarly they said prabhupad is this aquarian gospel a bona fide book prabhupad said it's a gospel isn't it he says no they said actually it is not a part of the it is not of the part of the christian canon so he said that there is a it is a book which was recently discovered and some people call it people call it the gospel so prabhupad said so is that is that good so prabhupad said that part of jesus christ going to jagannath puri is good and he just laughed <laughs> and prabhupad didn't quote from there afterwards so prabhupad didn't quote from there afterwards so prabhupad taught shastra and wherever he taught shastra that is that that is his compassion but while teaching shastra prabhupad also drew from other sources so prabhupad uh, drew from some other sources and if those sources were not reliable then to point that out so is it that we have to defend that because prabhupad said this so the aquarian gospel is the right gospel and are we going to go and tell the catholic church you are wrong because you don't accept aquarian gospel our guru accepted it no prabhupad heard from someone and then when he heard that it's not authorized he didn't accept it so you now we have to understand what prabhupad's greatness is prabhupad is teaching shastra and when prabhupad is teaching shastra that is his glory but if prabhupad has learned certain things from some other sources and those sources are unreliable then we don't have to think that we are being unfaithful to prabhupad by pointing out that those statements are coming from a different those statements are coming from a different source so how to understand nityanand prabhu's mood as an avadhuta with respect to our sadhana and preaching activities uh, in uh, in our path how can we follow nityanand prabhu well generally it requires a very exalted level to follow nityanand prabhu so uh, generally we, we it's it's important to follow the rules before we can rise beyond the rules so follow the rules means you know, we have to practice our sadhana properly we reach to call to reach out to people according to our adhikar according to our capacity and eventually as we become more and more purified then maybe some of the things which nityanand prabhu did we may be able to do uh, so rather than uh, thinking that we can prematurely follow nityanand prabhu we can just appreciate his mercy and try to access his mercy at this stage then in exceptional situations maybe with the blessings of senior devotees sometimes we may go into areas where normally it may not be advisable to go but some devo- sometimes we may go so but generally at our level it's best to simply access his mercy appreciate that he is so merciful but focus on right now gaining that mercy not on sharing mercy in that mood hmm. so mahaprabhu left householder life to preach but he asked nitan prabhu to go to householder life for preaching so how is this to be integrated well that is that is the meaning of desha kala patra that spiritual life is not a stereotype it you know to grow spiritually or to share spirituality it's not that there is a set of bullet points that we tick 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 i did this i did this therefore i am spiritual now it is actually a, a change of heart for us and it is inspiring a change of heart in others and that's why it requires time place circumstance understanding so 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, the, you could say, the primary, the Pradhan Pracharak, the primary preacher. And he was teaching a message of bhakti at a time where Advaitavad, along with Sanyas, Advaitavad says that serious, uh, impersonalists say that actually serious spiritual life begins only when you have renounced the world. So, Sanyasis were highly respected. Grahasthas were not respected that much. So, Mahaprabhu wanted he, the message of bhakti. And they thought, they, they used to propagate, okay, bhakti is nice, but it's for less intelligent people. It's for sentimental people. Those who are really intelligent, they will practice jnana. They will Vedanta Vakyeshu Sadara Manta. They will analyze Vedanta Sutra Vitas. So, Mahaprabhu was the greatest pandit at his time. Even at the age of 14, he had defeated Kesho Kashmiri. But Mahaprabhu, so, he actually, in one sense, perfected the chart that a typical Advaitin would follow. That he was a great scholar and then he just, there's a twist that he became a Bhakta. But because he was, a, he was a Grahastha and he was a Bhakta, people disrespected him. So Mahaprabhu took Sanyas, or not uh, Mahaprabhu took Sanyas and he took Sanyas apparently in Advaita Sampradaya. So that he could have that respect. And then not that he wanted respect, he wanted his message to have that respect. So, for the purpose of spreading the message far and wide, <clears throat> what happened is he actually and, uh, took sannyas. Now, Nityananda Prabhu, uh, once the message has gained respectability, especially among the intellectual, he wanted Mahaprabhu wanted that message should reach even the masses, not just the masses. You could say even among the most the, the most who are those not who are or degraded among the masses. And for that purpose, he felt the sannyasi couldn't reach, and the agrahasta could reach. So, again, that is an example of the purpose being important. And whatever purpose is required, however that purpose can be fulfilled, mm. uh, the, the different people may do different things for that purpose. So, now what does causeless mercy mean? Mm. Now, causeless mercy does not literally mean that there is no cause. What it means is that the cause is too less for the mercy. <laughs> that the cause is too less for the mercy. So if it is literally cause, if it is completely causeless, then the question comes, why does one person get it and why does another person not get it? No. Is the Lord discriminatory? See, the Lord is not partial. He is reciprocal. He is reciprocal. But then the causelessness is that his reciprocity is far out of proportion with our mercy. As we say that we take one step towards God and he takes a hundred steps towards us. So in the biblical tradition, there's a story that uh, Jesus talks about how God is merciful. So he says that there, were, there was a village where there were very, very poor, poor people with jobless and having no money. And a wealthy person, a wealthy farmer came to the marketplace and saw many poor people. These hungry people, he says, you know, you, you want to earn some money? He says, yes, work on my farm. So the, he came in the morning and many people worked on the farm. And then again, went in the afternoon and he found there are many other people over there. And when he went in the afternoon, he said, would you like to work and earn something? He said, yes. They also came and worked. And in the evening, he gave wages to everyone. And his farmer gave equal wages to everyone. And then those people who were working since the morning, they protested, you know, we worked, we worked more, double there. We worked from morning. These people only work from afternoon. So he said that, you know, I am giving you what you promised, what I promised you, and I'm giving them what I promised. Now, why do you compare? So the mercy, so he told this parable to ind indicate the principle of mercy. That mercy is reciprocal, but it is not mathematically proportional. There has to be some desire from our side. But it is not our desire that qualifies us for the mercy. Rather, that desire opens our heart so that the Lord can bestow the mercy. So why do some people never get the mercy? Because, because they may never open their hearts at all. So a causeless means not that there is no cause, but the cause is too less for the mercy. Prabhupada would give an example of causeless mercy. He Once he was on a morning walk and they were near a pond and there uh, one man this is in America, one man was throwing some breadcrumbs and other things to the to the ducks in the pond and he was throwing to everyone and there was one duck which was quite very loudly, very loudly 
very loudly. And what was happening was this man was throwing more crumbs to that duck. So now it is not that by that greater quacking that duck uh, had earned the right to get more. But it is that, okay, it, because the greater quacking that attracted attention. So Prabhupada said this is mercy. So the more we pray, the more fervently we chant, the more diligently we serve, the more we attract mercy. But that doesn't mean that our sadhana or our seva is the cause of the mercy. It is the Lord's compassion because of which the mercy comes. But our seva, our sadhana are ways of showing him our eagerness. So in that sense, it is the causeless mercy is that the cause is too less for the mercy that is coming. That's how we understand causeless mercy. Okay. So how do we open our hearts to receive such mercy? Well, generally, our hearts open by the um, by the association of devotees. Prasanga majaram pasham atmanha kavayo vidu sa eva sadhu shukruto moksha dwaram apavratam So that in general, attachment to the material is very difficult to give up. Our, our hearts are filled with so many material desires and material cravings that it's very difficult to turn to, uh, to even have any space within our heart for Krishna. So that's how our attachments bind us. But pras so prasangam ajaram pasham. Ajara means that which never grows old. Ajara. So we, our bodies may grow old, but our attachments don't grow old. They still stay strong. Prasangam ajaram pasham. Atmana Kavayogita. The wise know it, this is the nature of attachment. But Sa Eva Sadhu Shukruto. If somehow we can get attached, attracted to the saintly people, Sadhu Shukruto, then what happens by that is so our heart may not open to Krishna, but our heart may open to a devotee of Krishna. And yeah, this nice person. Yeah, I would like to serve this person. I would like to assist this person. I'd like to do something for this person. If not, at least I want to hear from this person. I want to learn from this person. That little appreciation for a devotee of Krishna is itself the opening of the heart. And through that, what happens is moksha dwaram apavritam. The doors to liberation open up. It says, so that's how our bhakti usually begins. And this also points to a converse responsibility. For all of us, when we are in functioning in the world, when we are practicing devotees, you know, we need to act in a way that opens people's hearts toward Krishna. Not everybody will be receptive to Krishna to take a bhakti, but generally if we are polite and courteous and helpful in our dealings, then even if people don't, they, the people are not interested in Krishna bhakti, they don't agree with the practice of Krishna bhakti, they don't uh, appreciate the philosophy, but still they will say, oh, no, that's a nice person. And that is a nice person that itself is can can be a quantum leap in their spiritual journey. That can be the seed of the opening of their heart. So for uh, so that's how generally through appreciation for those who are devoted to Krishna, our hearts start opening. And when we are already practicing bhakti, when we want to open our hearts more, what we can do is look for what it is that we currently are attracted to in bhakti. Now what is it that uh, that we can give a place for in our heart. So generally, love is seen in two ways. Love is seen in what we give to our beloved and what we give up for our beloved. Two things, what we give to our beloved and what we give up for our beloved. So if we love someone, we want to give offer them the best things. Parents, they love their children. Then they want to offer the best things to their children with the best education, the best facilities. So they give for their children. And what they give up for their children. That means, say a parent may, they want their children to study comfortably. So the parents may take loans and, or they may live in a very, they may live in a room without air conditioning and they may have their ch child's son's library, children, child's son's or daughter's library with air conditioning so that you can study comfortably. So what you give up for your beloved. So similarly for us at our stage in Bhakti, just the fact that we have come for this program, 
we, there is some opening of the heart. So with this opening of the heart, we can try to see what can we give to Krishna and what can we give up for Krishna. These two are indications of Sharanagati. In fact, there are two, two principles of Sharanagati. Anukulyasa Sankalpa, Pratikulyasa Varjanam. Except what is favorable. That means that which we can uh, that which we can give to when we give to Krishna, what does it mean? That means we give Krishna a place in our heart. Generally, when you give our time, our attention, in all religious traditions across the world, charity is emphasized. Now, why is charity emphasized? It is not just because religious people are after money, not at all. The idea is that, that actually speaking, it's very difficult for us to give Krishna a place in our heart. So the idea is that if we can't give our heart to Krishna, then we can give what is in our heart to Krishna. We give what is in our And usually money has a prominent place in our heart. So when we give our money to Krishna, then what happens is that much place in our heart comes to Krishna. Okay, so if we, Prabhupada would say, don't just give books freely. Let people pay for the books. Because if they pay for the books, then they will read the books. So that is the idea. So in general, to open our hearts for the two, try to think of these two things. What can we give to Krishna? And what can we give up for Krishna? So, okay, is there anything that I am attracted to right now in Krishna Bhakti? Maybe I like to hear Kirtans. Maybe I like to hear a particular devotee's class. Maybe I like to do some puja. So whatever we like to do, try to do that in a committed way. Try to do that in a consistent way. Hmm? At least that one thing, do it consistently. But there are many other things to do in Bhakti. And if you can do other things, also wonderful. But at least become committed about this one thing. So Krishna, every day, uh, I will do Kirtans for 15 minutes. Krishna, every day, I will read Shastra for 15 minutes. Hmm? So that is uh, what we can give for Krishna. And then what we can give up for Krishna is, is there something which is unfavorable for our bhakti and we can sacrifice it? That will also please Krishna. So if we have some unhealthy indulgences and we can give them up, that will also please Krishna. That will also open our heart to Krishna. Okay. So that's how we can uh, move closer to Krishna. So uh, regarding class on Varahadev, well, right now I am not giving any class. Tomorrow I am giving another Nityantra Yoshi class only. But on Varahadev, I have several classes on my website. I have two websites. Uh, thespiritualscientist.com where I have answered almost 7,000 questions. And there are about 4,000, 5,000 classes. 3,000 classes. There are classes on Varahadev also. So you can find that. And then I have another website called gitadaily.com where I write every day a 300 word article on the Gita on understanding it uh, logically and applying it practically. Okay. Thank you. Well, Mataji for sharing this thing. So we'll, uh, quickly does li liberation refer to detachment from material things or to the soul's travel to Goloka? Well, both there is uh, Jivan Mukti and there is Videha Mukti. Jivan Mukti, there are, there are different kinds of liberation. So Jivan Mukti means a person is in this body, but they have no attachment to worldly things. They are as if liberated. They are living in this world, but they are not living at all for this world. They are living only for the Lord. So to the extent we develop detachment, to that extent we can say we have developed, we have become liberated to that degree. So Jivan Mukti means we have no attachment to the world. And Videha Mukti is where a person, they, they give up their body and then the soul goes to spiritual world. So both apply. Mm. So when, so last question quickly, Haridas Thakur and Shrivas Pandit could not find Ityan Prabhu and sent by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm. But well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself went and he found Ityan Prabhu in the house of Randana Acharya. So is there a tattva behind this Leela? Well, this is, this is the pastime which describes the entry of, you could say, Nityanand Prabhu into Gaur Lila directly. So, broadly speaking, this is more of a rasa pastime, but the idea is that uh, it, is, it is more meant to be relished, but the broad understanding is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at one level wanted to establish right from the beginning 
the exalted position of Tyanand Prabhu. That not only that he that you that that you cannot find him, but he is so important that I will go out of my way to find him, and I will find him. I'll take the endeavor to find him. So Nityan Prabhu, is, what happens? See, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was the head of the Vaishnavas over there, and how much respect he would accord to others, that you know, that would indicate that would define that person's position. So the very fact that he wanted to meet Nityan Prabhu means that Nityan Prabhu is a special person. But okay, we can't find him. What to do? Abandon it? No, you can't find it. Then I will myself go and find it. And in this way, he showed how important he is for me. And of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also very respectful of Tyan Prabhu. So in that way, he through this past time he established right from the beginning the extremely important position of Tyan Prabhu among his associates. Okay. So thank you very much for this uh, combination of very deeply devotional theological questions as well as uh, practical philosophical questions. And I'm happy to be of service. Happy to have this opportunity to share. Uh, bhakti wisdom with all of you. My best wishes and prayers that Ityanand Prabhu also shower your mercy on you. you know, just as the center that Niagara Falls, there's a lot of water falling. So I mean Ityanand mm -hmm. Prabhu, you had Ityanand the falls over there. The Ityanand Prabhu's mercy may mm -hmm. fall profusely. And we can reach uh, many, many people who come there and who are there. So my best wishes and prayers to all of you. Thank you very much. Shri Tyananda Prabhu ki jai. jai. Shri La Prabhu Pad ki Pad. jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Jai. Nitai Gaur Premanande. Hari Hari Bol. His grace. His grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu ji ki jai.